Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a very important discussion about ESSA, SEL assessments, and accountability. Before we begin the program, I'll review just a few quick housekeeping items. The majority of today's time is going to be spent answering your questions. Many of you submitted questions when you registered for the webinar, so we'll start by answering some of those. However, we encourage you to send in additional questions you may have now or as they come up for you during the webinar. Our panel will get to as many questions as possible in the time we have. To send a question, use the questions feature in your control panel, and I'll put it into the queue to be answered. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the questions feature to get my attention, and I'll do my best to resolve the problem for you. We will be sharing a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides with you, so keep an eye on your email inbox tomorrow for details on how to access those materials. Um, our panelists will be um, sharing quite a few URLs and resources, and I know you'll want to have access to those, so we will be sending them your way. Now let's get started. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists today. We'll start off with a few remarks from Linda Dusenberry, who has worked with CASEL for more than a decade. During that time, she has been involved in CASEL's reviews of evidence-based SEL programs. In the past several years, she has also led CASEL's reviews of state learning standards for SEL, and more recently, research on mindfulness. Linda has published more than 70 professional articles and chapters and is a nationally recognized expert with 25 years experience planning, supporting, and evaluating evidence-based strategies designed to create a safe and nurturing world for children and adolescents. Linda is joined today by Hannah Melnick, who is a research analyst and policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute, where she co-leads the Early Childhood Learning Team. She is the lead author of Encouraging Social Emotional Learning in the Context of New Accountability and has a focus on school climate and social emotional learning. Before LPI, Melnick was an elementary school teacher and conducted research on California's local control funding formula and early learning systems. Hannah and Linda are also joined today by Jeremy Taylor. Jeremy is Director of Assessment and Continuous Improvement for CASEL and is currently focused on supporting CASEL's partner districts across the nation to effectively monitor systemic SEL implementation progress reliably and validly measuring students' social and emotional competencies, and using SEL data to improve practice and support student learning. He is also leading CASEL's efforts to convene a national work group for establishing practical assessments of social and emotional competencies for students from kindergarten to 12th grade. We're really looking forward to the insights and information that our panel has to share with us today, and especially to the responses to the many questions that we received. Um, so, Linda and Hannah are going to kick us off, um, and Linda, we will hand the program over to you. Thank you, Emily, and um, I want to say to all of you, we are very excited for the webinar today, and as the Director of Castle State Work, I wanted to welcome you all to this important conversation. I want to begin by telling you just a little bit about Castle State Work in order to set the context for how this brief came to be that Hannah Melnick of Learning Policy Institute will be sharing with us today, and why we at the CSI think today's conversation is so important. Based on work we've been doing with states since 2003, in 2016, CASEL launched the Collaborating States Initiative, which is a learning community for state teams that's usually led by a state's education agency. Teams develop customized plans for advancing SEL in their state, and I would invite you to check out our CSI web page on this slide and um, to also explore the tools and resources that connect to that page, along with the CSI Emerging Insights report that we released earlier this month that talks about the promising approaches we see states taking to advance SEL. And by the way, the CSI is continuing to grow and we'd be happy to talk to any state working group that might be interested in joining the CSI community of practice. Um, so you can find my email right here. Please feel free to reach out directly to me or you can find additional information on the webpage. Um, the reason we at CASEL are so excited for the conversation today is that our work with teams from 25 states across the country in that work, one of the questions we often hear is, especially in the age of ESSA, what are the most important recommendations states can make about how to assess SEL? 
The CASEL CSI has always seen the original 2017 report by LPI encouraging social and emotional learning in the context of new accountability as one of the best resources for states and districts to help answer that question. In fact, we think it's that this resource is so important in this conversation that we invited Hannah and her colleagues at LPI to consider writing a brief shaped especially for state teams to share some of their key recommendations for policymakers at the state level. We're very happy that Hannah and her co-authors agreed to do this, and we are thrilled to be able to share their brief with you today. Hannah, we are so happy to have you with us, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, so as Linda noted, last year, my colleagues, Linda Darling-Hammond, Shauna Kukarvi, and I wrote a paper called um, Encouraging Social and Emotional Learning in the Context of New Accountability. It's about how to leverage opportunities under the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, to encourage SEL by including indicators that are related to SEL in states' continuous improvement and accountability systems. So now, as states are beginning to implement and refine these plans, or work, we've worked with CASEL on a brief to pull out some of the key points relevant to the work states are currently doing. Next. So as many of you know, uh, ESSA allows states to expand the definition of student success from beyond just performance on standardized math and reading tests that were the focus of No Child Left Behind. Um, and this is really critical because more than ever, employers are looking for social and emotional competencies like flexible thinking or the ability to work on a team, persistence. So for students to be more successful, we need classes that are more than just sit and get, like the picture you'll see on the left, um, but ones that are actually collaborative and engaging, like the photo you see on the right. We'll only get these classrooms at scale if social and emotional competencies are part of state and local visions for education. And this means they're represented in the standards, the curriculum and assessments, as well as accountability and continuous improvement systems. Next. Um, so just to be clear on the terms we're using, CAPSLE defines social and emotional learning as the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel uh, and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Next. The, so this pyramid shows that a positive school and classroom climate are foundational for social and emotional learning, um, which in turn is needed for academic learning. Um, and I wanna really make sure that we understand the difference between a school and classroom climate in SEL. Um, a school and classroom climate that's positive feels safe um, and includes strong relationships, engaging coursework and adequate resources. And so this is going to be a place um, where students really thrive socially and emotionally. On the other hand, if students are in a chaotic or punitive school climate, they're going to have a harder time developing the social and emotional competencies they need to build relationships or work through tough problems. And this has important implications for assessment and accountability. We need to measure not just how students are performing on academics or social and emotional competency assessments, but how well schools are setting them up for success. So states can think of their accountability and continuous improvement systems as multi-tiered. Um, in LPI, we broke them into three or four categories. Um, the first category of uh, accountability systems are the, the ones that are gonna be top of mind for many people working at the state level. Those are the federal indicators under ESSA um, that must be reported for federal and state accountability. These are used um, to identify schools for improvement under ESSA. Um, many of you might be aware of the, identifying the bottom 5% of schools. Um, and any measure that meets uh, ESSA's criteria needs to be well validated, comparable across schools, and data needs to be able to be disaggregated by student subgroups. Um, there are also state reported indicators though um, that are distinct. So these can be reported for schools statewide, um, 
but and used for state and local improvement. Um, but they do not need to be used to identify schools. Uh, so instead, these are really focused on directing resources for voluntary use at the school level. These measures still need to have a high level of validity, but perhaps don't need to meet all of ESSA's requirements. And finally, there are indicators that a state um, might support or might be locally selected. Um, these are indicators um, that should be voluntary and really focused on improvement at the school or the classroom level. Um, these do not need to meet ESSA's requirements, and we'll talk about some measures that might be most appropriate for this category. So in our report, um, we look at three different types of measurements that states are currently using um, and considering for accountability to promote social and emotional learning. We group them into ones that uh, are looking at student social and emotional competencies, ones that look at school climate, and then related student outcomes. So the first are measures that focus on students' own social and emotional competencies. These include student self-reporting on surveys, uh, teacher observations of students in the classroom, or even performance assessments. Now, there are a lot of promising measures um, that look at social emotional skills of students, but we recommend, and so in CASEL as well, that these measures be used for local use only or be supported by the state at this point. Um, these measures are relatively new and not yet appropriate for accountability systems, especially when the stakes are high. Um, however, they can be a great way of gauging student strengths in area of growth in the classroom or school level. Um, measures of school climate, however, are different. They might be more appropriate for state reporting systems or even uh, use under ESSA. Um, this show how schools are setting the foundation for social and emotional learning. The most widely school, used school climate measures are student, teacher, and parent surveys. And these surveys can be used to identify whether students feel safe, included, supported, and challenged. Um, these surveys can be used as indicators under ESSA if they're of students. Uh, teacher and parent surveys can also provide really useful uh, information, although they do not meet ESSA's requirements, so they can be state reported instead. Um, and next slide. So just to be clear, the difference between a social emotional learning competency survey and a school climate survey, um, here are some sample survey items which students or staff would answer and scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And you'll see that the SEL items ask about a student's own competence, while the climate surveys are asking what a school is doing to support that student. So finally, in our report, we also consider how suspension rates and chronic absenteeism rates um, are related, uh, to, are outcomes that are related to SEL and school climate. So suspension rates are related to SEL because how students behave in the classroom is, is connected to how safe, involved, and welcomed they feel. Kids are gonna stay in school, um, furthermore and have reduced chronic absenteeism if they feel engaged and supported. So while there are many reasons for chronic absenteeism or high suspension rates, um, they're very connected to SEL. Uh, kids are going to stay in school and suspension rates are going to decline if students learn to recognize their feelings and resolve conflicts. And teachers can play a big role in supporting these competencies and making sure um, that kids feel that they belong. So what can states do to support social and emotional learning under ESSA? Um, the first point we wanna make is that they can support measures of student social and emotional competence for local use, um, but really states should not yet require these measures statewide, uh, at least not yet. Second, um, we, do we do encourage states to include measures of school climate supports for SEL and related outcomes in their statewide um, reporting system. Um, where appropriate, these data should be available to schools in a really user-friendly way, disaggregated by student group, grade, uh, even sometimes class level, so they can guide decision-making. Uh, third, we believe that it's critical that states provide districts with well-validated measurement tools. 
not all schools are going to know where to find good measures of school climate and uh, social and emotional competencies. So the state can curate resources and offer to pay for them. They can also uh, offer measures of SEL implementation, which is critical to the success of programs. And uh, CASEL has an implementation rubric that's available to both districts and schools, which Jeremy can say more about later. And finally, um, states should offer resources and technical assistance for data analysis and professional learning. We all know that data alone is not going to drive student success, and strong professional development um, can help, help state or schools act on the data that they receive from their um, measures under their accountability systems. And this means training district staff and school principals, as well as teachers, um, in both the data analysis and then the implementation of strong uh, interventions after the fact. So I want to note that the Learning Policy Institute has many uh, related resources um, to what we are going to discuss today, including a forthcoming report in interactive maps that shows how states are using their indicators under ESSA. So if you'd like to le learn more, please sign up for updates. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Emily for a question and answer. Great. Thank you so much for providing that background information and the overview of the brief, Hannah. And um, all of you who registered should have received a link to download that brief. It also is included in this um, PowerPoint slide deck that we'll be sending out tomorrow. Um, so you'll be able to um, access it if you have not already. Um, so now we are going to move into the questions um, that were sent in um, ahead of time, and then we'll see how many of the questions that are coming in now that we can get to. So Hannah, I think this first one actually um, belongs with you, and it is, where can I find high quality measurement tools? Sure. Um, so in the full report that this brief is drawn from, we provide a number of examples um, of measurement tools that um, Emily can show you a glimpse of in slide 20. Um, for school climate surveys, there are a few compendia of resources that the American Institute for Research um, have put together that provide a lot of good information. Next slide. Um, and we've highlighted some of these surveys in uh, a table in our full report. Here's just the, the top part of that table. Um, for example, we show that there's a free survey that's available from the U.S. Department of Education um, for school climate that can be modified based on state's needs. Um, and there's also uh, in our report um, a list of strong social and emotional competency um, survey tools, but I'm gonna pass it to Jeremy who can offer more guidance on assessments for SEL. Sure, thank you, Hannah. Um, so um, there's a few resources out there, I think that in addition to the report that Hannah mentioned that I can highlight uh, measures that are available currently for social emotional competence. Um, one of them also by the American Institute for Research, their Ready to Assess Toolkit um, highlights some measures um, that can be used for various purposes. Hannah, um, Hannah or Linda also mentioned earlier that uh, CASEL currently is spearheading a national assessment work group for social emotional competence um, that's focused on a few things. Um, and one of them in particular is focused on creating um, a Practitioner's Guide for Social Emotional Confidence Assessment. So it's, uh, it will be available later this year um, and um, it, it will focus on uh, highlighting currently available measures of student social emotional confidence, um, and in particular those that um, are used in practice and have characteristics that make them reliable and valid for some particular purposes that are highlighted um, in the guide. Um, so, uh, in addition to that, we also look, look forward to providing some guidance, not only on how to select measures, but how the data from those measures can be used effectively. Um, and that'll look uh, like uh, highlighting some examples from different purposes, um, and also giving some examples uh, from the field of collaborators from CASEL or from some of our work group members um, who are working with uh, schools and districts across the country, and, and what it looks like in practice um, to use some of these measures that are highlighted for various purposes. So we're looking forward at that point to, to giving more guidance on specific measures. But at this point, um, we would encourage uh, people to think about uh, making sure they align those competencies or those measures with um, whatever uh, frameworks they're using 
uh, for SEL. So uh, aligning with their instruction um, and making sure that they're using an evidence-based program or approach that whatever competencies it's focused on are aligning well with those with those uh, that measure. And if they have standards in place or, or learning guidelines, um, that those are also of course highlight uh, aligned with that program and then ultimately that measure. Um, and then in, in in terms of specific what which measures offer that alignment, um, uh, we look forward to providing that guide later in the year. Great, thank you. And Hannah, um, this question actually came up, but I think we ought to take it now instead, instead of the, the next one we had in order, um, because it is related to the slide that we have up now with the school climate um, index. So what criteria did LPI use in identifying the school climate measures? Sure. And these um, are criteria that I'd encourage anyone to think about. Um, when we looked at the measures that we included in our report, we asked four questions. Um, first, what is the indicator measure? And how likely is it that data are actionable and can lead to meaningful improvement? You really want your questions to be specific enough that they're gonna guide further inquiry and action without um, being so long that students can't sit through the whole survey or um, take the whole assessment. Um, second, for what was the measure designed and how might data be distorted if attached to high stakes? So for example, um, an assessment that's designed for a one-on-one -on -one setting with a counselor might not produce valid data when administered to all of the students in a school. Um, once you attach consequences such as a state intervention or even just public reporting, this may affect the degree to which individuals try to fake or game a measure. These are really important considerations. Um, third, does the measure generate consistent, reliable data? This means, are the results consistent under similar circumstances? And you should look at the properties of an assessment um, to see how rigorously this has been um, tested beforehand. This is important. Especially important if you're trying to uh, look at growth over time. Not all assessments are built to show you how students are growing from one point in the year to the next. And fourth, does the measure meaningfully differentiate between schools and subgroups? Um, if this is not clear, then these um, assessments should not be used for high stakes accountability because people might make the wrong inference looking at the scores at one school compared to another. Um, and one important consideration is reference bias, whether students um, will have a different point of reference when they're answering questions um, or responding to prompts that might um, make their data incomparable to students in another situation. Thank you, that was helpful to walk through that and get that information. Um, Jeremy, we've got another one for you. Um, are there any uh, ready-made free surveys to help schools and districts plan for school improvement resources? Sure. Um, so I think there's a few different things you could look at. Um, so first of all, I think as Hannah mentioned, there are some climate measures that are out there that I think can be helpful in, in identifying some improvement targets um, and, and sort of cer certainly climate is one of the, uh, improved school climate is one of sort of the outcomes of implementing systemic SEL. So doing, uh, having a climate survey that you reflect on regularly is certain, certainly one way to identify targets for your SEL implementation. In terms of uh, identifying um, a plan for implementing SEL, I think there's a few different things available. First of all, um, Hannah mentioned uh, an implementation um, rubric um, that is available and we will be sure to include in the follow-up email uh, from this webinar uh, links uh, to access it. We have a, a theory of action with Castle at the district and school level. And with uh, those theories of action, we have implementation rubrics to guide um, at the district level, the SEL team and implementing SEL systemically district-wide. And then at the school level, uh, similarly at the, uh, for school-wide implementation. Um, there is also a, a staff survey for SEL implementation that's also available um, and, and we also include. Um, both uh, the district and school level measurement tools are actually currently under revision. Um, so what we'll provide um, here is the current, the, the versions that are currently uh, in use. Um, 
but we have some new ones coming out later this year. They're in beta testing right now. Um, at the district level, one of the main changes is that there's more explicit uh, attention to uh, adult social emotional competence development, um, as well as um, equity uh, and how SEL supports equity. And then finally, uh, integrating SEL into academic instruction. So there, so the the major difference in the in the new versions um, are connected to those three uh, changes. Uh, but those will be available later this year. I'm happy to to make sure that those current versions are available currently as, uh, in the follow-up email. Great. Yes. And as Jeremy said, you will all get an email tomorrow that has a link to the recording, the slides, and these additional um, links and references that our um, panelists are speaking about. So don't worry if you haven't been able to write everything down. Um, you'll get access to them later. Um, so Hannah, next question. Um, how can these tools we've been talking about be best used in accountability? And also on the flip side, how might they be misused? Sure. Um, so we might flip back to the slide that shows the um, federal state reported and um, state supported table to show the tiers of accountability. Um, I think a really important consideration for data use and misuse is um, as the folks at the core districts in California like to say that the measurement tools are used as a flashlight and not as a hammer. So that's to say we're using the data to figure out what's going on in the schools and how we can help and not to shame or blame kids, teachers, families, or schools. What you really don't want is for a school to say, oh, well, our survey shows this group of kids doesn't have self-control and blame the kids or their parents or even their teachers. Um, so schools are really going to use data to help students. They need to be equipped to understand the root causes of um, any uh, assessment results. For example, some schools are starting to measure kids' growth mindset, their belief that they can get better over time with effort. And this can be really great. Um, but if students are scoring low on growth mindset, you need to understand why. Uh, and one of the best things you can do is to ask the students. Um, ask the students why, you know, what is, uh, difficult for you? Why don't you think you can succeed? And if you really dig beneath the surface, you can find some surprising answers. Um, and with growth mindset, often students believe they can't succeed because they've never had that proper academic scaffolding in school. They haven't had the opportunities to experience small successes in the classroom. So we need to make sure that we're really understanding uh, the causes of the data and the solutions are usually not just to fix the kids, but to provide adequate um, instructional or social emotional support. So for what does this mean for states? Um, first, anytime you're gonna hold schools accountable for results, you need to make sure the district and school leaders really understand what they can and can't infer from the data. And second, states need to focus on high quality professional learning for teachers and leaders. Uh, they need training on how to support students socially and emotionally, building strong school climate. And this is really not easy work. There needs to be investments that are sustained over time. Um, if schools feel like they're being called out for doing poorly on a measure, but they don't have the resources to improve, uh, it's not going to be a useful exercise. Excellent, that was a helpful overview on that. Um, and there's just kind of as a follow-up question, which maybe um, Jeremy wants to pipe in on as well, but what parameters may need to be in place to assure that our measurements are helping and not harming our students and families? Sure, uh, well, I think some of them overlap a little bit with what Hannah was saying, but I can go through more specifics. I think the first parameter is that we wanna make sure we're thinking about how the assessments are used to inform systemic improvement, right, rather than evaluating individual students um, for these SEL assessments. Um, so, you know, in the classroom, that might mean um, using the results of previous year's data to, for a teacher to think through where are the areas of strength and opportunity for growth among their classroom, among their students, and how, what is, you know, are the implications for instruction? What, what should we focus on? Uh, to start the year and as they go forward with instruction, um, how sort of uh, might their decision making around the instruction be, be adjusted based on what they're seeing in the results, but the focus being on, um, on the data informing their strategies for instruction and not necessarily um, 
uh, identifying a certain kid uh, as having a deficit or, or labeling a kid in that way. Um, at a school level, um, it, it could be thinking about the results of a social emotional competence assessment um, for planning around professional development or allocating um, resources for SEO programming um, or, or maybe closing uh, disparities uh, among different students who uh, might not have had equal opportunities. And so thinking about how not only this data can be used to identify opportunities for growth in the district or school, but also um, where you might see disparities in, in say, um, kids' feelings of belonging or, or strength in relationships. And, and when you find those disparities, um, whether it be uh, in subgroups of, um, of, any, of any kind, um, making sure that the focus is on the root cause uh, at a system level and what system improvements can be addressed uh, to close those uh, those disparities that emerge when they are when they're found. So that's another way um, of making sure that there's an intentional thought through process for how to use that data um, is an important parameter. And that, um, as the slide here highlights, that the schools and districts are provided uh, the, the training necessary and, and professional learning necessary to be able to sort of engage in that process um, in a way that, that they feel confident in. Um, and then finally, at the district level, just at the school level, I think these measures can be used um, to, to inform what SEO program is adopted and what kind of training or professional development is done, um, as well as uh, potentially over time monitoring the, the impact um, or changes in, in practices from SEO programming that's being implemented. Um, so I think, I think there can be some possibilities at multiple levels, but the key is that the, um, it, the purpose needs to be sort of be, be stated as system improvement. I think that's a key element of that. Yeah, that I think is the, the guiding force <laughs> behind all of this. Um, and it looks like we do have another question for you. Um, do you have any um, thoughts and or guidance in terms of best practices for the use of universal screeners for emotional, social and emotional behavioral screeners? Yeah, it's a good question and one that we kind of get quite a bit um, at Castle. And and I think it, it, really the, the answer to that question comes down to what um, one means when they say screener, right? If, if what they're really meaning by screener is just a brief assessment that uh, provides a snapshot um, I think there's lots of uh, effective ways that could be used uh, in the ways that I just described, right? So you could uh, very well um, provide a brief assessment um, to all students uh, throughout a school or district to inform planning and decision making, as I just outlined. Um, I think where I might urge some caution is if what we mean by screeners is actually identifying a deficit in a particular kid. Um, to uh, uh, sort of refer them for additional services or things like that. Um, I think that's where we might uh, urge some caution against using them in that way. And that's uh, simply because if schools are setting out to sort of identify emotional or behavioral problems um, that kids may need support for, uh, we would encourage them to, to use measures that uh, are in existence and were developed for those purposes and were validated and intended for those purposes, right? So there's lots of, uh, strong measures out there um, that uh, were intended to use to identify kids who are having some of these struggles and might need some supports, um, but we would caution against using a strengths-based social emotional competence measure um, and just using low scores as that equivalent. Um, uh, similarly, we would also urge caution in the reverse, which is using problem scales, uh, whether it be behavioral problem scales or emotional um, uh, problem scales to uh, as measures or proxies for social emotional competence. Um, and the reasons are, are very similar, which is, um, first of all, that, that they weren't developed that purpose. So you can't speak to the reliability and validity for that because they were if they were developed for um, identifying clinical needs for students or, um, or, or, or problems that are in existence. Um, but the other reason also is that they're not going to be as useful for guiding instruction. Um, social emotional competence assessments that were developed explicitly um, for um, measuring strengths and assets are going to provide targets for instruction in ways that uh, measuring a, uh, a problem uh, won't if you're trying to sort of uh, reach a positively oriented competency. So it's kind of the difference between um, measuring relationship, strong relationship skills um, 
and the descriptors that you might use uh, for instruction to do that um, versus measuring um, uh, sort of interpersonal conflict, right? And, and um, measuring high problems with interpersonal conflict isn't going to necessarily give good guidance in terms of how to instruct strong relationship skills. So sorry for that little bit wordy answer, but I hope that's <laughs> No, I think that was an excellent answer to, to a large question. So I think you condensed <laughs> it well. <laughs> um, Linda, turning to you and to the um, four recommendations that are here on the, the slide from the brief, um, in your work with state agencies and districts, um, do you have any examples that you can um, point to on how states are, are acting on these recommendations? Thanks, Emily. Um, that's a great question. And for this one, I am going to um, turn to two experts um, that we have with us on state and district work, Heather Hirsch and Vicki Blakeney. And I'm going to turn first and introduce Heather Hirsch. Um, we are so happy that Heather was able to join our conversation today to share a bit about the great work her team in Minnesota has been doing. Minnesota recently released a wonderful set of guidance on assessment, along with a fully developed set of competencies and other um, important guidance. And you see this website um, where you can find a, a lot of um, great resources developed by the team that Heather's been working with. But she helped to lead the process in Minnesota um, that resulted in all those resources. And one of them that I would especially draw your attention to when you visit the website toward the bottom of the page is um, a resource um, that provides guidance on assessment developed in the, uh, that was developed by the state team. So Heather, I would turn to you and ask if you could tell us a little bit about your state's example and the story of how that guidance got developed and um, to share anything you'd like to say about questions or goals that may have driven the work in your state. Sure, thank you, Linda. Um, my name is Heather Hirsch. I am with the Minnesota Department of Education. And we are fortunate in Minnesota to have a law, a bullying prevention law, that requires districts, um, kindergarten to 12th grade, to be doing social emotional learning work. And my role at the state agency is to help districts implement that law. And so a, a component of the law, the requirement to do social emotional learning, it, it's just that. It just says they have to do evidence-based social emotional learning. And so I brought together a group of stakeholders and, and um, eventually connected with Nick Yoder and then eventually connected with Castle um, to think about what that really meant as a state agency to give guidance on doing comprehensive social emotional learning. And the first thing that we did was develop a set of competencies based on the Castle framework. And um, we modeled them after our state academic standards because we felt like that would be really familiar for school districts. But our stakeholder group, which was about 40 to 50 individuals from across our state, really felt that just releasing a set of competencies was insufficient. And that in order to actually be usable, um, they should come with implementation guidance and assessment guidance and some information about how to coach and train and provide professional development on those uh, competencies. And so we spent about two years, two and a half years total developing the competencies and then the guidance that went with it. And the that is what is on the link. If you click on the social emotional learning um, assessment guidance link on your screen, it'll take you to a page and it walks through our process. It talks about the stakeholders involved, it talks about the review process, it gives you a link to the implementation guidance, it gives you a link to all of the competencies which have grade banded benchmarks, accessible learning goals, sample activities, and connected to the Minnesota academic standards. And then it also has assessment guidance. And our assessment guidance is really the things that a district needs to think about. Like, what are the different types of assessment? How do you know if it's a valid measure? How do you know if it's a reliable measure? Are we really measuring the thing that we want to know about related to social emotional learning? And so it, it walks districts through those conversations that they need to have about good assessment and echoes everything that Hannah said around, um, you know, SEL assessment we don't feel should be used for high stakes accountability on its own. And 
then how you use it, though, at a classroom level and at a school-wide level and at a district-wide level and at a community level to support the work that you should be doing around social-emotional learning. Um, and so that is really what's captured in that assessment guidance, um, which ultimately uh, was contributed uh, contributed to by over 100 different stakeholders from across the country, um, mostly from Minnesota, but then also uh, we were fortunate to have folks from across the country provide guidance and feedback on, on that as well. Thank you, Heather. That was really helpful. And now I'd like to turn to Vicki Blakeney to ask her to join the conversation. Um, and by way of introduction of Vicki, I would say that she, like Heather, brings a vast experience to share in this conversation about both standards and assessment at both the state and district level. Um, for example, many states and districts working to develop SEL competencies or standards are very familiar with the Anchorage standards for SEL, but what you may not know is that Vicki led the Anchorage effort and is now working in a district in Washington state. But before that, for a time, she led SEL at the state level in Nevada, and in that case was also thinking deeply about how to measure SEL using school climate. Um, Vicki, could you tell us a little bit about your views or experiences on how schools may have assessed SEL and outcomes, especially um, any that you may know of that have been designed specifically to align with standards, for example, um, and any lessons learned or observations you'd like to share? Sure. Um, so I think I'll start with uh, some of the the work that we did at a school level, if that's okay, as part of the district that I worked at, um, because it kind of combines a little bit of everything that you've been talking about in this really informative um, session so far. And I also want to put out a disclaimer that uh, I think that my, my thinking around assessment and social emotional learning has potentially changed quite a bit after having read the Learning Institute's brief, the first time, or Learning Policy Institute's brief when it came out originally. Um, so I just want to set that as my framework. When we were in Anchorage doing the work, we used as our chant, um, what gets assessed uh, gets addressed. So it was really, um, at that time, social emotional learning didn't have as much of a foothold as it does now. And so we were really trying to figure out how to make sure that our work was sustainable. So we did a lot of um, looking into what assessment would look like for us at a district and at a school level in that instance. So we used, for example, a Greener, similar to what Jeremy was talking about, we used it as a, uh, I thankfully, I believe we used it the way that he was describing it. So we used a um, universal screener and then a little bit deeper specifically, and I don't know that it matters which one um, for this purpose, but the specific one we used was the mini DESA and then the full DESA as a screener. And then we used that to um, guide our work. And I, I'm really still very fond of that particular way of using it. We didn't use it to identify kids necessarily, but to help us to sort of unjumble uh, the schoolhouse, as they say, uh, to figure out, are we doing so much effort on um, one particular social emotional area and leaving another one completely behind? And, and are we, what, what is the real need of our classroom and, and of our students? We also used it to um, verify that the social emotional learning implementation that we were doing was having an impact on growing kids' social emotional skills. So um, we used it for those couple of reasons. And then we were really excited to find out that um, it was helping us to also address some of our um, cultural competencies, just because we knew that if we, um, we discovered through the research that we were doing that kids that scored higher on our screeners, um, if you factor out all the other things, still were able to achieve higher on our standardized tests and mitigate our, um, our cultural achievement gap. So that was a really interesting finding for us. Um, the other thing that we worked on was building rubrics for our standards because Anchorage had developed standards, so we built grade level rubrics. I'm intrigued by this now that I've read that brief and trying to decide if that was a good idea or a bad idea. Um, it was one that we did, and, and I still am interested because a lot of schools still use what we call the left side of the report card. A lot of schools, in fact, my kids got their report cards the other day and it talked about whether or not they were um, responsible or whether or not they 
you know, we're good friends to other kids or things like that. And I, um, I appreciated our attempt at seeing if there was a way that we could do performance measurements around that or something a little bit more than just, um, gosh, it's the last day of school and I got to put in grades. What do I think about, was this kid on my nerves this week or not when they put in their grades sort of thing. So we really worked with Marzano Institute and uh, Robert Marzano to, to dig into what did our, what would this look like based on our standards. Um, however, it took an awful lot of technology that we didn't have able to support it at that time. So we've only actually used it in the kindergarten. But I feel like it was really successful in that kindergarten. Um, then we did school surveys, like you're talking about. And the thing that we found in our uh, school climate survey, we tried to put in, at that point, a social emotional learning construct. Um, and it was not as you put in your wording actionable, in our opinion. So our school climate survey was really valuable because you could tell if you were implementing intentional social emotional learning in your school that your entire overall school climate score would go up. Um, but what we weren't discovering is that our social emotional learning scores on their own would go up. And so um, we stopped kind of using that scale for anything other than the overall way that it would move our school climate survey. So when I began working at Nevada's Department of Education, and shout out to my friends in Nevada who might be on this, um, they looked really intentionally at what are we going to do for the school climate um, scale for the state, but also how are we going to address social emotional learning? And we um, copied or borrowed or um, worked with the Washoe County School District to use their uh, social emotional learning construct embedded within the school climate. Um, Scale that we had used. And uh, I think what we found that I liked about that was that um, when we looked across the state at the school climate scores and then the social emotional learning construct scores, because Washoe County had been the first to really intentionally dig into social emotional learning, their social emotional learning construct scores were much higher than the scores around the rest of the state, which helped me to believe that it, it, whether or not it was actually um, really identifying a kid's individual growth in social emotional learning, it was identifying that schools had intentionally done some work around social emotional learning. So we were able to use it more in terms of, you know, has this school done some intentional work? And if so, we would assume that their social emotional learning skills would improve. And in that instance, they did improve. Um, so we use the school climate surveys like that. Here in the district I'm in now, where we are using a lot of the US DOE um, questions from their school climate survey that you've heard referred to, um, and also uh, borrowing from uh, some of Panorama's free surveys and the Washoe survey that we used in Nevada to start, and we're just doing our base um, baseline data right now. But what we like about that United States uh, Department of Education version is that I think one of the drawbacks that we have of getting a school climate scale for is that it, principals have a hard time knowing what it means unless you can say um, it means something um, in comparison to something else. And I don't so much like the idea of, for example, one high school here in Renton comparing itself to another high school here in Renton to determine whether or not they're doing well. So we're trying to go bigger than that so that we can get more of a, a national framework. And then I will end my conversation with uh, the idea of um, what really I thought was the most valuable type of measurements that we did in because the question that I was asked was around the school or district level. Um, I really like when teachers were willing to do some self-assessment and I think there's some really lovely um, self-assessment in terms of what kind of uh, school climate and supports for social emotional learning should be out there. And I liked it when teachers would go in and do some self-assessment to see um, whether they're putting in those school supports or not, and then making some action plans to change those. And I think there's some nice tools for that, as well as for sort of if I was going to walk through school, what would I look for? And uh, I think I'll end there unless there are other questions. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, another great um, set of examples. Uh, we're very grateful. And um, Emily, I will turn it back to you for the next question.
Great. And yes, thank you, Vicki and Heather, for um, providing um, those insights into what you're doing in your states and uh, and other states, Vicki, you touched, touched, on, touched on a lot of them. So that was very helpful for us. Um, switching gears a little bit here and going back to Hannah, um, here is another question. Um, how can educators be trained to use these tools well in service and pre-service? Sure, um, and thank you so much, Vicki, for those examples. It's really helpful to know what this all looks like in practice um, at the state and the school level. Um, so for school and district leaders, um, in terms of training, I think something that's incredibly important is being able to choose reasonable and targeted learning goals to identify the most important underlying issues um, and be able to help staff improve in that targeted area. Um, and just to piggyback a little bit on what Vicki was saying, you have to really know um, what you can expect to move the needle on in uh, a given school year. Um, for teachers, I think one of the most important foundations is to know how to set up a supportive learning environment. So when teachers get the results of an FBL survey, um, they have some concrete strategies to support that student throughout the school day. Um, just having an FBL curriculum with some explicit lessons is very helpful. Um, I don't want to say that having an FBL curriculum is not uh, really important, but it's not enough. Um, so teachers need to have ongoing professional development opportunities to think about how they're including and welcoming students teaching them in a culturally relevant way, um, how they're setting up collaborative group work, opportunities for students to see their success and celebrate it over time. And this is all really difficult work um, that's gonna require ongoing, um, sustained resources for professional development. So Elf Learning Policy Institute has a few resources that I'd like to direct you to that might be helpful. Um, one is a study of the key elements of high quality in service professional development. Um, and another is a forthcoming book on teacher and leader preparation for deeper learning. This looks specifically at institutes of higher education um, and how you can train teachers before they get to the classroom on how to integrate um, social and emotional learning and deeper learning activities um, into their school day. And the last one is um, a report that's coming out this summer looking at uh, the teacher pipeline from um, pre-service to in-service. And this looks at uh, first San Jose State University um, and what they're doing to with teacher candidates to make sure that teachers understand how to integrate SEL um, into academic content. And then how um, one school in California um, in Sunnyvale School District is using an SEL assessment, the DESA, and how they're taking the data from that to uh, integrate the courts into the classroom. Um, so please keep an eye out for those, but I just really wanna stress the importance that these professional learning opportunities need to take place over the course of a school year or multiple school years. They're not just one and done. Yeah, I think that's important. And I think it's important, as you said, to, to really be um, infusing SEL into um, the teacher training that happens before our young teachers ever hit the classroom so that they're then entering the classroom with this base of knowledge. So um, thank you for that, Hannah. And um, Jeremy, you mentioned in some earlier comments, you, you referenced um, equity. Um, how can the SEL lens on equity be integrated with ESSA? Sure. Um, so I, I think we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'm happy to sort of elaborate a little more. I think one, one of the the uh, the focus and and outcomes of SEL, uh, especially when done systemically, is developing um, equitable learning environments for all kids. And so when you think about um, doing that, uh, thinking about uh, do kids of, um, of of different race or ethnicities or different um, uh, backgrounds or um, uh, of any subgroup have different experiences in school, whether it's different senses of belonging or or, or um, feelings of safety. Um, thinking about how SEL can be sort of a target for for those disparities, and then in particular connecting to ESSA, um, if uh, states or uh, are are following some of the recommendations that Hannah and our colleagues at LPI have have outlined here and included climate as part of their accountability systems, then um, again going back to that um, process of identifying 
root causes, as we said before, that um, if that is part of that system, then um, going through and, and doing that careful look at the data um, and disaggregating by subgroups and, and identifying where disparities might exist and then taking a real hard look at this, the way that the existing systems might be um, inadvertently sort of contributing to or not fully supporting students uh, in ways that could support, that could close those disparities. Um, so thinking about, I think that, that attention to climate and uh, creating an equitable learning environment, um, I think is, is one really important way that the SEL lens and equity and then attention to um, that data is some one connection, I think, to SF. Great. Well, I think that we could go on for several more hours with the questions that we have coming in, um, but unfortunately we are um, running up against our end time. So I do want to thank everyone who joined us today out in the audience, as well as a very big thank you um, to Linda, Hannah, Jeremy, Vicki, and Heather for joining us to share all of their information and insights and experiences. Um, with us. I think it's very helpful to start to, to get a look at what our options are for um, SEL assessments and, and again what Vicki and Heather are doing in their states was very helpful to take a look at. Um, so just a reminder to everyone because this is the number one question we've received. You will get an email tomorrow that includes a link to the recording as well as to the PowerPoint slides and then also to these URLs um, that Jeremy and Hannah and others have referenced as they talked and answered these questions that have come in. Um, I also want to let you know that when you log off um, the webinar today, you will get a little pop-up that encourages you to take a quick um, five or six question survey. It's very short, um, just to give us some feedback on what you learned today and what um, you might like to see in future webinars and information from CASEL um, and our partners like LPI. So um, please take a moment to do that. Um, it does help us um, plan for the future and provide you with information that's helpful. Um, and finally, we encourage you um, to explore the CASEL website and the LPI website. There's lots of resources and information um, that Hannah and Jeremy and others mentioned today. And so it's a really great starting place um, for you to, to find information. Also, at the, the beginning of the webinar, um, Jeremy had mentioned the assessment work group and the URL for that is here on this slide, so you um, can explore that as well. CASEL is a part of that, as well as some of the other um, organizations that you see on the screen. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and keep an eye on your inbox tomorrow um, for that follow-up email with more great resources you can use.